Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Sunny Agarwal, and I'm here with Federica Ernst, and today we're talking with Guy Ziskind, who is the founder of Secret Network, which is a, well, not really a new, but it's actually a quite a, you know, um, it's been around for a long time, actually, and we actually had Guy on, uh, what, maybe four years ago, I think, 2018, uh, and back then the project was called Enigma, and so since then it's gone through a you know number of evolutions uh, and became what it is today called Secret Network, uh, but still focus on the same mission of bringing private smart contracting uh, to the uh, cryptoverse. So we'll, we'll talk a little, uh, about with Guy about Secret Network, but first we'd like to tell you a little bit about our sponsors for the week. Our first sponsor is Paraswap, and with Paraswap, you can beat the market price every single block. It's fast and highly liquid and just launched their version 5, which has a new contract and new APIs. It has a more modular infrastructure, with it, which is more gas-friendly and now supports free approvals using Ethereum permit messages. They also recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, and BSC. And you can always use Paraswap with your Ledger device right in Ledger Live. Go to paraswap.io and get started. Are your crypto assets sitting idle in your wallet? Start earning rewards and contribute to the network security by staking with Chorus One, a staking provider securing over $5 billion in assets over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, Ethereum, and Secret Network. Uh, Interested in running your own branded nodes, the managed white label Node as a Service offering leverages Chorus One's highly available and proven infrastructure, enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. If you have been a loyal Solana delegator with Chorus One, make sure you check your wallets. In the first ever major NFT drop by any validator, Chorus One will be dropping over 3,600 exclusive NFTs to its Solana delegators according to their delegation profile in December 2021. But if you missed out on this airdrop, don't worry. You can still participate in the upcoming airdrops for Cosmos chains by simply delegating to Chorus One nodes. Head over now to Chorus.one to begin your staking journey. So, uh, Guy, welcome back onto the show. You know, as I mentioned, you've been, you were here a long time ago, back in 2018. And so, you know, hopefully we've gained a few listeners in that time. And so maybe for like any of the newer listeners who maybe didn't listen to the previous episode, uh, you know, can you tell, maybe start off with telling us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in crypto? Sure. So first of all, uh, thank you for having me again. It has been a long time, so I'm excited to be here. Um, Epicenter has always been my favorite podcast. About myself, I've been in the crypto space for, you know, since 2013, 2014, depends on how you count. Uh, 2014 is really where, when I dived in. I, start, I started uh, grad school at MIT. And um, there was, just before I started grad school, there was this like MIT Bitcoin hackathon, uh, which we built a cool product for. This is like pre-Ethereum even. Um, And we won that hackathon and that got me kind of like excited. And I like, what we can do with this technology? And I uh, went to my professor and told him, look, I wanna wanna focus like my research, my work on this like emerging technology. So, um, you know, fast forward in a bit, I very quickly became interested in, you know, how, how blockchain can have inherent privacy, not just in the transactional sense, not just in like the Zcash or Monero way or transferring assets with privacy. But if we're thinking about blockchain as like, you know, these, these uh, more um, um, involved, like uh, 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 replicated state machines, more involved decentralized cloud computers, then surely there's need to be a way to handle sensitive data uh, in those uh, Web3 applications. So I focus on that. I focus my entire research on it. I wrote a few papers. They got a bunch of citations, um, pretty uh, uh, pretty substantial citations. And that kind of led to the Enigma project, which I spun out as a company in 2016. Um, and then in 2017, we did, we did an ICO. Um, and we started building that network. 2017, we did an, 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 a token sale um, for Enigma with the idea of building uh, a network, not necessarily a blockchain, but a network that allows it to run privacy-preserving computations. 
Um, and, you know, somewhere between 20, around 2019, um, we kind of realized that it's not working the best way. That was about the same time that Cosmos was about, I think, either just released their, their SDK or was about to release their SDK. I was really fascinated. I was actually very fascinated by uh, Tendermint Consensus. And then I looked into the SDK and said, wow, this is, this is like much better. Like we should be using that. And then we pretty much uh, uh, scratched everything. And then uh, and kind of like the, the, between end of 2019 and 2020, just like rebuild our architecture around uh, Cosmos SDK. And early 2020, we released, um, you know, Secret Network. Um, we we um, used a different brand to kind of distinguish it. Um, it had a new coin called Secret. And then in September 2020, we actually launched like the, 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 the privacy capability. So basically in Secret Network, you have the ability to run um, encrypted smart contracts, where both the input, the inputs, the, the contract state, and the outputs remain encrypted, and you can basically build end-to-end uh, decentralized applications with privacy. And the network has been growing substantially since. I think we're one of the bigger Cosmos uh, chains today. And uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of like the history from 2014 to 2020. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. Um, I'd like to dig into the switch to Cosmos. So basically, you said that the Cosmos SDK um, was uh, just a lot better than your previous technology stack. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, look, our core offering, our core capabilities is like, how do we build privacy into smart contracts? And pre-Cosmos, like, like, you know, there was an option to fork Ethereum or do that, but that really didn't, that didn't really work well and we didn't want to do it. So we started building our own P2P stack, our own, uh, some, some kind of consensus. Like it wasn't really consensus because we were relying on Ethereum for, for consensus. But we spent like, I think 80% of our development, our testing, like building that infrastructure that, you know, it was just a waste of time. Like, like, that's not what we wanted to focus on. And then Cosmos gave a great SDK. Uh, truth be told, at the time, I think it improved today, but at the time, the SDK was great. The documentation was horrible. So it took us longer to get, like, fully onboarded and working with Cosmos than we could have had, like, today. But still, like, all the parts were there, and instead of, like, focusing on building a P2P layer and a consensus layer, we have that forgiven and we can just focus on the other aspects of our technical stack. So how were the, the reactions from the community when you uh, rebranded and switched tech stacks? So um, people were confused. <laughs> we were selling ourselves for a long time as an L2 to Ethereum, as an L2 to other, other chains. Like at that time, people did not believe in a, in a cross chain world. Like everything was like, at least in smart con in, in, that related to smart contracts was like, no, 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 everything has to be on Ethereum. Like, what are you guys doing? So we got mixed reviews, um, but we didn't care. Not that much. I mean, we, it's always better to get good feedback, but like we just knew this was the, the this was the right approach. And I think you know. Uh, in the test of time, it's 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 pretty proven that this was the 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 right course of action. With looking back, is there anything you would have changed in how you uh, how how that process went? There's one element which I think the jury is still out on. So at that time, Cosm Wasm was just starting on. It was still a prototype as well. We've actually helped Cosm Wasm quite a bit. Like one of our team members became a co-contributor to Cosm Wasm. Um, and I, I think there was a big question like whether we are doubling down on Cosm Wasm and WebAssembly or focusing on EVM, which is kind of what uh, Eve Moss is now trying to do. My gut feeling is that, you know, we made the right call. I do think that 
going the cousin was a web assembly route is, is is the better approach I feel that that's what cosmos is consolidating around um, so I think it was the right decision but I'm still not sure I think we'll know that in a year or two would it be possible you know uh, to like for secret network to support multiple VMs in the future or is you know is the goal really to like focus on like you know you lose composability benefits and stuff when you, if you start to do that. Yeah, it gets complicated. You most likely lose composability. I'm, I'm, we're not 100% sure. Like it may be, it, it's a matter of effort. So supporting multiple VMs is a lot of effort once you stuck with one. Now we can do it, but you know, we are still a fairly small team in terms of the developers, not the ecosystem is big, but in terms of core developers, we're still small. So not sure that's like where we want to put our effort in. Maybe. And in that case, yes, you start to run, run across problems like composability, other types of like integrations. Um, yeah, it becomes, it, there will be trade-offs for sure. So, Guy, um, let's talk about the secret network. So, there is, um, if, if I understand correctly, um, there's currently 50 nodes. Um, so, basically, how is it determined 70. how many nodes can participate? 70, sorry, okay. And um, why is there an exact number? Right. So, we initially we set it to 50 nodes. The reason was that, you know, in our network, one thing I didn't mention that you know, there's one requirement for running a validator in a secret network that other networks don't need. And that is, uh, you have to use SGX. We use secure enclaves to achieve privacy that combined with like um, uh, security and encryption protocols. Um, and there is some, some cost associated to it. So like, you know, if you run it without SGX, it's not like, orders, it's not like, you know, multiple times faster, but you do get some some speed reduction. And so we, we thought that starting with like, you know, 50 nodes, basically smaller than I think the 100 or 150 that Cosmos chose and other chains chose, we felt that was the right number. Um, it wasn't an issue until like the last six months. In Around six months ago, when the network was starting to grow really fast, like we got a lot of people want to become um, validators and um, that's why there was a network vote to increase that to 70 recently. So you're right, it was 50, but recently it was increased to 70 due to a vote. And I do think we'll, we'll, we'll um, I, I think we'll extend it over time. We're also, a lot of our work for the next year is around improving like the VM and like, you know, making that work faster. And I think as we do it, it will be easier to grow the, the number of nodes. Guy, I, I think um, probably about more than 50% of the listenership are familiar with what SGX is, but maybe for, for the rest, can, can you, um, in a nutshell, um, explain what a trusted execution environment is and what kind of trusted execution environment SGX is? Sure. So a trusted execution environment basically is is kind of like a, a, a segregated piece in like your process or your memory which basically is com like completely walled out from anything else happening in that system and no one can probe into it, not even the person uh, owning that physical machine. It's essentially a generalized hardware wallet. You know, a hardware wallet is essentially a piece of hardware where it allows you to run one computation, which is to sign transactions, but, the, but you can't probe into that wallet and actually extract the sensitive data, which is the private key. So SGX works very similarly, but it allows you to run any kind of computation. And then any data that you push into that enclave, uh, into that uh, uh, trusted execution environment, can't actually be seen by anyone, not even the validator running the, running the machine. Just one quick note, there are different kinds of, you know, trusted execution environments, pretty much any big vendor today, like, like that, that's building processors has, has a version of it. So ARM has a version, Intel has a version, it's called SGX. That's what we're using right now. And AMD has its own version. How does the network know 
whether the nodes um, trust execution environment is legitimate. Right. So that's one of the first things that we did. We we built um, a registration protocol. So that that's where we kind of diverge from like normal Cosmos. So when you add your, when you join as a new validator in our network, essentially you need to go through a registration process before you can start to validate blocks. So what you would do is um, you would um, um, run some code that we wrote inside of your trusted execution environment. And that code basically says, it, it generates a, 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 like a, a key, a key pair, right? Uh, a, a private and a public key pair. And then the enclave signs it. It's, it's a process called remote, remote attestation. And then like the, 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 the remote attestation, the signature uh, over the generated public key, um, that blob of information is then posted on chain as a proof that you're running a genuine enclave. So essentially, uh, uh, SGX and, and other systems, they basically allow you to verify externally that um, um, a, a computation has happened inside of the enclave it you know it correspond to a specific piece of code and it ran correctly and it ran on a genuine enclave and now that's been put on chain everyone can validate that um, you know that new validator is running a secure enclave they generated this uh, key pair inside of the enclave so the private key and the and well the public key is as interesting but the private key that was generated never left the enclave. Okay, and now uh, any other validator can basically take that information, uh, take that the, the, the publicly know that this was done in a genuine enclave um, and, and uh, um, encrypt it, encrypt some kind of shared seed, uh, shared seed that all validators uh, share um, and uh, put the encrypted seed on the on the blockchain. Now the validator that's registering can complete the registration by taking that encrypted seed, because we know that the private key for that only lives in the enclave. We know that the validator can actually decrypt that seed and see it. They pull they pull it inside of their enclave, and they uh, decrypt it there. And now it's you know it's an ongoing process. Any new validator that comes in go through that process, and you get into a system that the base seed um, is shared by all enclaves. They've been vetted. And now, and now uh, uh, using that seed, you can derive new keys um, that, again, only the enclave can actually uh, uh, use to decrypt stuff. And now information coming from the outside, you can use, you can use using those keys Again, all of them return to the, the base entropy from that seed. You can use it from the outside to encrypt stuff and then send it to the validators' um, um, enclaves. I hope that's not too dense. I don't know if, if anything is confusing. I mean, feel free to ask for clarifications. I, I think I've, I'll just follow up on this. So um, does, does this process... I mean, it sounds like magic a little bit. Um, so does this, pro, uh, does this process actually work without relying on the attestation of Intel or whichever chip manufacturer you're using. Um, so basically, can the secure enclave prove um, that it's not being watched? Or how exactly um, do, do, do you come by that attestation? So the initial registration part does rely on Intel. It's called uh, Intel. Um, ISV, I can't remember the Intel Service Verification. I can't remember the, the acronym, but it does rely on Intel to basically say, look, we have like that signature, that remote attestation, which is essentially a signature, is from a genuine enclave that you know we manufactured. Now, I do believe that in the next version of SGX, which we are working on including, there's flexibility in that, like there's ways to do it without 
without actually going remotely to into servers. We have not implemented that yet, but it does, it does exist. That said, the process that we are generating, that we're generating you know, a private key and a public key pair inside of the enclave, does mean that we only have to do it once for every validator. And at that point, the network can really kind of like self-manage and self-sovereign. Cool. Can, can I follow up again on the SGX? So basically, if I have a consumer notebook, would that typically have an SGX? Or would I have to buy a special computer um, to actually have that included? It used to be the case. That is actually that is actually something that, you know, our network has an infrastructure committee, which basically checks like at all times, like what are the supported hardware and what you need. I think to be fair, like we can talk philosophically if that's the right direction, but to be fair, uh, it seems that a lot of validators are becoming more professionals. So they're running, they're not running notebooks anyway, they're running, um, um, you know, serious uh, server infrastructure. Um, um, again, a philosophical question, but it used to be the case that like any notebook uh, would actually have SGX support, but Intel, I think in their latest chips have decided to only do that, only enable that in servers. So the answer is um, no, no longer, or at least new notebooks do not support SGX as far as I know. But again, I think it's less of a problem because everyone in our system, in our network are like mostly professional validators that are running servers anyway. Do you know what caused Intel to like sort of reverse direction on that? So we, we have pretty good ties with Intel. Um, I've asked that. I didn't get like a fully clear answer. Like I think that's, that's something that's very internally important for them. But my thinking is that, you know, they want to focus on high, like using SGX and Enclave and confidential computing in very, very high loads. And that works better with servers. Like they want companies to provide their services you, uh, protected by things like SGX and Enclaves. Less so, or originally, originally the, the idea of putting SGX, as far as I know, in every computer was so that, you know, let's say there's, there, you, you da- like a company gives you an agent software that you run locally, not on the server. And that agent, you know, would run inside of an enclave locally. So you as the end user and the customer are comfortable that your software hasn't been tampered with. I think that that didn't become, like that didn't pan out as a good business direction. And it was just costing them more money than it was, you know, uh, giving them. Also, as a little bit of a DRM solution, I remember that was sort of like one of the things that they were pitching early on. So only the validators need a, uh, you know, so the, the, I guess there's like different classes of users. So to use secret network, you know, I don't need to have a SGX in my own computer to just be a client. Um, but so I guess two questions. One is would, if I just want to run a full node, uh, not as a non-validator, do I still need an SGX? And two, um, what, what kind of, how does the, security model change from when you're not running if you if you you know if you don't have an sgx and you're you're you know rely relying on a validator like so i guess you know one on one side i feel like you know maybe you can even improve the like client security model from normal because you can you know rely on certain aspects of the sgx to improve that but on the other hand how does yeah so i guess more interesting is how does the privacy model change then i mean first 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 of all Um, this was mostly for simplicity. Like we thought about doing like a hybrid model where full nodes don't are like somewhere between a light client and a a full node and don't actually have to run a GX. It was too complicated. I mean, it's not, we can't do it again. It's a, it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis. And so, so, so for now, even full nodes need, need to run a GX. Obviously end users and clients, like they don't need to, they don't need to at all. Yeah, can you talk about the, how the light client would work? Because I know this has been a big issue in many privacy coins, like in Zcash especially, where you can't 
you know, there is no light client that exists for Zcash. So is there a light client that exists for Secret? Not, not really. Um, but like, you know, when it comes to like specific things, so like, like there, there's a concept of viewing keys and pretty much anything that's encrypted, like you can give a viewing key, for example, to Kepler and then like, you know, they can, they can get like read only access to like important information. So that's usually the way that we, that we solve it, but no, there's no proper light client yet. Yeah. Okay. So then back to the previous question. So like, wh what does, the, so how do I like, um, what kind of privacy guarantees do I get when I request, a, when I, when I try to use secret network, uh, like does the validator that I'm sending my transaction or like the validator that I'm querying information from, can they learn about like, you know, my data? No, they, they, the, the, the validators for sure can't. Um, you know, there's side channel information and secret itself, the coin is, is not private. So there's side channel information from that, like in many systems, but no, when you, when you send your information to a validator and then when it's, you know, uh, uh, run and edit to a blog, like uh, the, the inputs, the state and the outputs, they're encrypted. They're only being decrypted inside of the enclave. So like you, you, like there's, there's, there's nothing that you miss and, and we basically, for correctness, like we, we still take all of the benefits of Tendermint because, because of the, 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 the key sharing process that I, because of what I said in the beginning, when you register, you get a, a, a randomly generated seed, but then that seed is used to pseudo randomly and deterministically uh, uh, generate like the same set of keys for, for all nodes, for all computations, for everything that's, that's, that's going on. So consensus doesn't break, like all, all validators, even if they don't see what they compute, at the end of the day, like the blocks that they're producing, the, 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 tr the transactions, the outputs, like all of them are the same. I, I guess my question is, um, but if I'm querying data from the blockchain, so if I'm, so, so you know, you mentioned this viewing keys, like, so if I'm asking a, you know, I'm querying a note saying, hey, I want to know uh, what my balance in my account is. Who can, can anyone see that? I guess two things. One, can they see that I'm asking for a balance and from what token? And then two, can they actually see the balance itself? No, yeah. So let's take the example of asking for, for querying for like a token balance. So they would see that a certain secret wallet and they can see the, the address of the secret wallet is uh, 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 querying uh, for a balance. They will not see, they will know which token they're querying because each token is its own like, like uh, uh, contract. But A, they would, not be, they would not know that you're querying for a token. They would just know that you're interacting with, with the token contract from this secret address. And then um, um, the query would basically, you know, it would pull the, your balance from the state. The validator won't see it because like, like that part happens inside of the enclave. Then before releasing it outside of the enclave, I mean, there's, there's kind of like for each, for each uh, query or each uh, transaction, there's kind of like a derived key between the user and the enclave that uh, only the enclave itself can, can see and the user can see. So what happens is the enclave uses that to encrypt the query result inside of the enclave for the user and then release that. So only the user can client side uh, uh, decrypted information. The, the, the other part is that there's, there's a viewing key. So you can, you can share a viewing key such that, for example, another service could, you know, could, could, uh, could get some kind of read-only access and, and can also decrypt the information from a query. But those are the only parties that, that can actually see the results, either the user or whomever they gave um, a viewing key to. Does that make sense? Thank you. That's super interesting. Yeah, it makes total sense. I imagine, I imagine um, there are particular challenges um, to building the user experience building, you know, as, as a fully private chain. Um, what are those? So the, the, there are actually several challenges, both from a developer and a, and a, and, and a user. 
uh, from user perspective, right? Like whenever you're doing something, you first have to give a, a, a viewing key permission for the wallet. Like let's say there's a new token. So now there's another click where you need to create a viewing key for that new token. And then, uh, you know, let your wallet or the application use it in some, in some way, usually your wallet. And that's just like another click. People are not often used to it because it's like only on secret network pretty much. Um, that's something that we're working on. And recently we've enabled the ability to use permits. I'm actually not even the best person to explain those. Like that is even still new to me, but they make the, the process much easier. It's much more automated. Basically, it's like you don't have to create it a priori. It's much more automated uh, in that sense. Um, so that's one challenge. The other challenge that this creates is um, in many cases, you know, let's say there is a big NFT drop, right? And everyone are coming at the same time and they want to mint their NFTs. Well, they first have to like create viewing keys uh, to, to see those. Again, this is mostly solved with permits. Uh, but if you're not using permits, then that, then that creates like a lot of transactions uh, immediately on the network. And we have seen that uh, create um, some, let's say, difficult stress on the network that in other networks you don't see because you don't have that functionality. So that's like another challenge. And the third challenge is, um, you know, a lot of like if you look at Terra and other, and other networks, a lot of them, um, um, the, they cache the information. So, you know, let's say you interact with a contract and there's a lot of the same queries. There's mostly reads, just a few writes. So they would cache it, honestly, on a centralized server to kind of reduce the, load, the query load from the network. But here, because every user have access to only like one row, like their row of information, no one can see the full, like the full state. It, and, and usually each user just uh, queries their own row. You get a lot of, again, a lot of queries which you cannot cache. And that creates making optimization really, really, really hard. Um, I don't think there's a perfect solution there. We are doing, we're, we're doing quite a lot of work there to improve, but that's, I think that's part of the cost of you know, running with privacy enabled. How about from the uh, developer standpoint of view? Like, can I, you know, so, you know, as, as we mentioned, Cosmwasm is like, you know, becoming sort of the standard across many Cosmos chains, like, especially like Terra. Can I just go take a Terra contract and just one click redeploy it onto Secret Network? Or is there um, sort of additional hurdles that we uh, developers have to like go through in order to make their contracts uh, design working with the privacy models? Very few hurdles. Most of them are just like because of like ecosystem tools. So you know, Terra is Terra JS. We have Secret JS, um, um, but it's pretty much the same thing. We we've done it. Other people have done it. It's really simple. It's simpler than most people think. I think that's the the biggest benefit that you know we're all we're all converging to the same like you know. Um, um, model with Cosmosm where it's like very, very easy to cross deploy. And actually one of our things that we want to do in Q1 is we want to give a very, a very easy guide on um, um, if you deployed your app on Terra, here's how to convert it to secret in like, you know, five minutes. Do I, what about like for like, how do I define this like viewing restrictions, right? Cause you know, on, I, I'm sure on most Cosmosm, contracts anyone can just query any part of a contract here obviously i have to add a, a additional restrictions to say you know if you're trying to query this balance you actually have to be the owner of this balance um so are there like additional sort of i guess in the view func the read functions of the contract i just have to add more a little bit more restrictions there or is there anything more complicated than that i mean that's again if you want privacy if you want to do like more selective access control, stuff like that, and yes, that you need to add, that is up to you. I mean, technically you don't have to do them. It would work without it. Um, but if you if you want to use these functionalities, then you have to make slight changes, yes. But again, they're, they're, they're not big. They're usually not big. Can I, uh, when using Secret, can I uh, 
Do I do all contracts have to execute inside the SGX? So let's say there's some things that are just like you know, you know, because obviously, actually, maybe one thing before, like regarding that is like, how does computation, you know, expensiveness work in relative compared to something, you know, that you know, if all the cost, you know, I know one of the big issues with not issues, but you know, one of the restrictions with SGX is you have like. You know, it's definitely slower than running on a normal on a, on a normal CPU. You can't do like, can you do like hyper th- like you know uh, multi threading and like you have less RAM and stuff. So what, can you tell us a little bit about some of the restrictions that uh, a developer might have there? Sure. So uh, it's single threaded, but I think most executions in Cosmos Cosmos was were single threaded until recently. Um, we are working right now on adding multi-threaded support. Like that's actually almost done. So we are going to support multi-threading in SGX. It wasn't trivial, but that's one of the optimizations we're doing. Um, the, the memory issue, there's enough memory, but in many cases, because of the way SGX works, then, you know, you have, you have a lot of like cache misses. And, you know, if you, if you, if you don't, like, you know, efficiently load uh, information inside of the enclave and outside, then that could take a really long time. I think in our profile, and we saw that, like, you know, every time we open an enclave, we loaded the, we reloaded the contract. That is taken, in some cases, I think, like, the majority of time spent in running the execution. So, yes, there the, are the considerations there. It's not trivial. We are slowly improving these um, and resolving these, and I th- and I think we're in a much better position. The slowdown is not that bad today, but it's gonna really improve in the next year. That's that's one thing. The other thing, which is slightly an issue, is you know because of because of S- like um, SGX doesn't uh, for security reasons it doesn't allow you to use like standard libraries and stuff like that. Um, and so, like using something like Wasmer, which is the go-to, I guess, interpreter or just in-time compiler for uh, running Wasm code, and that's what I think Cosm, that's what Cosm Wasm uses natively. Like we couldn't use that not easily, so we um, uh, uh, replaced that. Um, that took a lot of effort, but we replaced that with Wasmi which is more like a pure interpreter, and that works, but that is much slower than Wasmer as well. So again, one of our, one of our things on the to-do list is to go back, reintegrate Wasmer in a way that is supported by SGX. So can I then like, so then in that case, like if there is, um, can I opt to have uh, certain contracts not run in the SGX where like, let's say there is just, you know, heavy computation functions that, you know, I have no reason to keep private. Um, can I, you know, reduce my gas costs by running those not in the SGX? Not right now, but that's a fantastic idea. From like a scalability perspective then here, right? Where would you place like um, the limits of where like SGX computation can go? Like, you know, you know, we have a spectrum, you know, like, you know, like, okay, how, do you think it will... Is SGX computation today, like, is it, can you do more than you can in the EVM or, you know, c- can it ever get to native Cosmosm scale or like even Solana style scale? Where do you see like the limits are going or, you know, assuming you can get all these optimizations you want, where do you think it'll end up landing? Yeah, I think that won't be an issue. I think these are engineering challenges. And I think at the end of the day, the slowdown, there will be slowdown. It won't be meaningful. I think the one place where I'm not sure is where in, in cases where you need to access, um, you know, let's say arrays of information. Like, you know, you want to access like, like you, you want to run through all of the users at the same time. That, that might be the only place where I think it's going to be problematic at the end. But everything else I think is, you know, we can resolve it and we will resolve it. So secret network is IBC enabled, right? So basically, how does um, how does um, the secret part work across different um, Cosmos based blockchains? So can you kind of can any IBC enabled blockchain query 
um, smart contracts or what, what? how does it work? So right now, we kind of did what Terra did and I think most chains. Um, Sunny, I don't know if you remember, but you and your co-founder with Osmosis, you gave us the tip to do this. Um, we, we, we only enabled like, you know, sending native, native assets on IBC right now between chain to chain. We do not support calling one contract uh, on our chain and on another IBC chain. That is something that's going to happen in, let's say, IBC 2.0 upgra uh, upgrade, which is going to happen sometime in 2022. Um, but so far, what you can do is you can transfer assets and you can also do something which we are doing. Like, for example, you can take Osmo or Atom or Luna or UST and you can transfer them to our chain and then via IBC and then you can wrap them um, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a token and that token gives you privacy. So for example, if you want to trade your Osmo privately, um, then you can move it to secret network, wrap it, we actually have a UI to do it very simply, and then you can transact with it, you can you know, split it different wallets, you can add it to secret swap, which is our AMM, and trade there and convert it to something else, and then you can you know exit back in I. You can de unwrap it and exit back through IBC to whatever whatever chain in IBC that you want. So th those are the capabilities that are enabled right now. And I was wondering, um, so can you use the SGX um, to do um, multi-party computation? Uh, I mean, multi-party. I mean, technically, what we're doing is multi-party computation, but we are using SGX. If the question is whether we can do multi-party computation like in its pure cryptographic form, then I would say that's that's a very different implementation. We can do it. It can use SGX to simplify th something. So some element of SGX can you know make the MPC protocols that you use simpler because you know you can try if you if you take an assumption for example that SGX. Um, you know, can protect correctness and, and, you know, whoever is running the code inside of an enclave will not break protocol. So you can use more like what we know is semi, but uh, honest, but curious protocols, which basically assume um, participant will try to leak data, but they will not change the protocol. So again, SGX can help us in developing like these kind of solutions in a much simpler and more scalable way. Um, but you know, they're, 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 they're another tool. They're not like, it's not that you get MPC for free. It's still a very complicated thing to do. And, you know, we talked about scalability so much. Um, I think MPC for general purpose computations, unfortunately, the, 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 the cost reduction, the, the, sorry, the, the, the cost increase and the speed reduction would be so heavy that I doubt any developer would use that, unfortunately, today. So, yeah, you know, I think one of the interesting things that I, you know, how, what I see uh, Secret Network is doing in a lot of ways is, you know, I think the SGX as a compute system, like, you know, it provides you basically like high levels of, you know, safety and privacy. But on its own, it never it de it doesn't provide liveness. And so one of the things I see it as, you know, I pitch Secret Network as when I explain it to people is like I, I call it like it's like a distributed SGX, right, where it adds liveness to to the you, you, to to the SGX platform. Um, and like so, you know, one thing is like, could we start? Could we also use it for things like a, being a, a custodian, for example? So you know, I think like. For example, I know the Avalanche bridge to Ethereum is basically running on a single SGX right now, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, but like the, you know, partially, and it's kind of crazy mostly because you know, it, if if it's a single SGX, you know, it could have a lot of you know liveness issues. Where like, sure, you can trust the SGX's safety properties, but if that machine breaks down, like we're in for a lot of trouble, right? And so, like, could we use the secret network as a distributed custodian in that sort of way? I think we can, and we actually have some grants that are, you know, taking that, that direction. Um, we have a developer, a core developer called Asaf. He just made an interesting tweet about how, like, DAOs can now control, like, you know, private keys, 
um, inside of their of, of their contracts and then with IPC and other things like essentially like do stuff on other chains through the DAO uh, because because it controls you know the the uh, the keys and yes and liveness liveness is pretty much guaranteed so I, I, by the way I like your pitch I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that if that's okay so okay, so here's the other part that, about you know the big question I have for SGX and so you know um, you know I, I you know we've worked a lot on like front running resistance uh, related things um, and like mempool privacy and I know that's like something that the SGX also you know secret network provides in a lot of ways but for me one of the biggest concerns I've had with like the SGX is you know we see that like there seem to be r- on a semi-regular basis, like flaws found in the SGX and, and the SGX and like, you know, people are able to find vulnerabilities and, you know, in my opinion, well, how I see it is like right now, the, the value in finding a vulnerability, like, you know, there isn't even that high of a benefit right now. It's been mostly like, you know, just academic research teams that have been finding these vulnerabilities, but, you know, as there's more and more economic value that's happening and you know if you can extract mev by breaking the security model of an sgx and extract billions of dollars of mev that that's essentially a billion dollar bounty on breaking the sgx and is that like do you think that the sgx can sustain that level of security budget i mean i i guess it's you know i i'm speaking from a position I do believe that's the case. I do believe for many, many use cases, that's definitely the case. I like the idea that Secret Network is the biggest honeypot for testing secure enclaves at scale. Um, so far, we didn't have problems. And, you know, anytime there's, there's a flaw, we immediately patch it. And, and, and then through a network upgrade, you know, you, you make sure that everyone is patched. We are very, very strict about it, even stricter than most other players I've seen using SGX. Um, but I, I, I guess it's to be seen. From my perspective, look, as you know, my background is in cryptography, MPC. Like, I am very, very much excited in the future to include other kinds of technologies that are, you know, more cryptographic in nature um, into Secret Network. At this point... Like, I'm more concerned that, you know, developers would not be willing to take the slowdown and the cost increase of using purely cryptographic technologies. And many of them have other other issues and constraints that people often overlook when they, um, when they present them. So in, to us, it's A, it's a balancing act. Like, we do feel this is the best solution for the problem right now. We like the idea that it allows us to check, you know, things at scale with high value. And then, you know, um, uh, over time, hopefully that would help us to make our system, enclaves, SGX specifically, enclaves in general, uh, more and more robust. But at the end of the day, like if the technology allows, if the users and developers demand it, like... I would be super excited to look again at MPC and even homomorphic encryption solutions, at least to, you know, to some aspects and some use cases that are being built on our network. And I really want to talk about the ecosystem, but now I have to follow up again. Damn you, Sunny. Um, so basically, um, if I'm a node in the in the network, and I, um, how would I, how would I know, or how would I find out about the fact that some SGX was compromised or is being viewed um, by something that's not the SGX? I mean, so basically, how um, how would I catch on? Or I mean, how how is is there like um, is there a cannery in the coal mine somewhere? Because basically, with a lot of the shielded protocols, there's no way to actually do checksums, right? The the once there's once there's a, so first of all, I do want to say that most vulnerabilities, you know, there are academic researches and 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 they are way 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 overblown. There has been very few of them, especially the ones in the early days, um, which which were. I think devastating and easy to exploit, not in a 
or not easy, but like, you know, possible to, to exploit, not in a laboratory setting. But putting that aside, um, you know, once there's, once there's um, 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 you know, an, an, an SGX issue, then we can trigger a hard fork, we can uh, 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 ask everyone to re-register, you know, the registration protocol that we mentioned, we can uh, trigger a hard fork and, up, and, and or post like an enclave update, and then everyone has to re-register. Every hard fork that, that happens, everyone has to go through the registration protocol again. And at that point, if they are not running the, the fully patched, you know, version of their SGX in terms of firmware and software, then they won't be able to register. So that's, and, and that's how people know, like, you know, there's, there's a hard fork in the network and yeah. Uh, so, but that's only if it, if it's brought to your attention, right? That there is yeah. a vulnerability in the SGX. So basically how would I, how, how would you find out that there's a vulnerability if it's not, um, you know, someone, uh, you know, white or gray hat who kind of uh, makes this publicly available information. Yeah, I see your question. If someone were to find a vulnerability, it's a black hat, they they don't disclose this, Intel isn't aware of it, we're not aware of it, then what happened? Could that could that exist? The answer is yes. I mean, I there's no there's no way to protect against that. You know, very much like with the Zcash, like, you know, um, um, yeah, um, publication there was a, a math equation error and you could have done like like you could leak the keys if I remember correctly and if someone had found it and not disclosed it and someone did then they could exploit it so there's there's no way we would know in that in that situation okay there's no way to know okay cool um so let's move on to um to the ecosystem so tell us about um, the kind of applications that are currently running on secret network um, yeah, that I'm pretty excited about. We have a few DEXs um, that are front-running resistant. They're doing fairly okay, not not as great as Osmosis, but they are used. I'm I'm an avid user of them. Um, the front-running resistance is really cool. The privacy aspect is really cool. Um, we have over a hundred million, I think, of assets. Maybe maybe even I mean maybe more depends on your count. Um, in our network that have either originated by projects in our network or have been brought from Ethereum because we have an Ethereum bridge from Binance Smart Chain because we have a Binance Smart Chain and from other IBC enabled networks. Um, so a lot of use cases around around that. Then there's we've released um, the secret NFT standard, which basically allows you to... Um, you know, launch NFT, NFT collections, and it's the, the, the point of being a secret NFT is that, you know, you can define private metadata such that only the owner can actually see the data, and that owner can give viewing access to other parties if so they choose, and where, you know, there's a, there's a big, um, uh, well-published, uh, we announced yesterday uh, with Credit Tarantino that there's an auction for his original uh, a screenplay of Pulp Fiction, which is something that no one has ever seen. It's like in his handwrite. There's a lot of things and details about the, the, the original script, notes to himself, like markups, markdowns, like, like, you know, comments, stuff that hasn't been in the, in the final movie. And that, is, that has been something that he kept private for 25 years. And now he's selling those as secret NFTs. And essentially, uh, that's gonna be in an auction in two weeks. And only the people who buy it would be able to see it, and then you know they they, they can decide if they want to if they want to give access to other people or not. Um, uh, so that's that's another use case. There, there's just a slew like so many NFT use cases right now. There's a marketplace called Stash that launched a month ago, and there's been I think like two dozens of NFT drops, and there's like new one every day, and each one of them use like the the privacy aspects. In, in very, very interesting ways. Um, there are a few games building on our network. And I think what we can provide that other networks can provide is that we can allow you to build your games with like hidden 
a hidden game state on chain. So for example, if you do poker, you can do it fully on chain because you can keep the cards themselves, you know, private for each participant until the right moment. So we've seen a lot of that. And we're actually seeing, um, uh, th there are the DeFi use cases. So there's private lending coming out this month by a company called Sienna and uh, other, there's Shade, which is gonna be the first privacy preserving stable coin, algorithmic stable coin. Um, it's kind of a mix between Olympus DAO reserve currency and a, and a fully pegged privacy preserving stable coin. Um, and then there are a bit more lofty ideas that I think are just gonna be, uh, they're gonna take time to be adopted, but I'm really excited about them. There's Data Vault, which is a data, a, 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 a secure data marketplace uh, for all kinds of like use cases. There's um, a doctor trying to work on putting some form of medical data on the blockchain and, and allowing like physicians to look into that. There's a company building credit scoring solution so that, you know, privacy preserving credit scoring. So, you, you know, you can do maybe like stuff like under collateralized loans on the blockchain. So a lot of things are like being built right now. <laughs> yeah, I think that's really cool. You know, I think, well, um, you know, a lot of these use cases makes a lot of sense. Well, one thing I, I do want to ask, though, is like, you know, for the NFTs, it seems like, you know, NF, you know, at least for my social networks and stuff, you know, I've seen, a lot of people are pretty excited about like the NFTs happening on Secret Network. Why, why, why do NFTs really want that much privacy? You know, it seems that usually NFTs are mostly about status signaling and I want people to know that I own the, like, hey, check out and look at my collection of NFTs. Um, what, what, what is sort of, the, what's driving the user demand behind like private NFTs? Well, first of all, you can do really interesting things that you can do. And like, we're just scratching the surface. So like, you know, there's like the, they're, they're like now redacted drops Well, you know, you see, you, you can brag that you have the NFT, you see it with the watermark or low resolution or a part of it is redacted. It's like a redacted club where like the eyes are redacted, stuff like that. But then the full picture you see for yourself, there was secret punks where like, you know, the background was was only the owner could see. There's um, Secret Skulls, which created a really interesting economic dynamics. The idea was that you mint or excavate a skull, and that has its base properties that's visible, but now you have several times where you can reveal traits, like one by one. And that created an interesting economic dynamic where people were like, okay, maybe the things that are worth the most is just selling a fully hidden skull, like with all the traits still hidden. Or maybe I reveal like one trait, you know, kind of like in Blackjack, I got like a really, really rare trait, but maybe the other ones are like, you know, they're crap and it's not really worth that much. So now there's an interesting game theory. Do I sell it now? Or do I keep opening and hopefully even increase the value farther? So there's a lot of interesting things you can do that you can't do with normal NFTs. And if you want status, then again, you can, you can reveal a portion or a low resolution version, or you can reveal the whole thing. That's fine. Like there's Adam's collection, which does reveal the whole thing, but then the private metadata is you added your Telegram handle, and that adds you to a secret chat that no one else can know about or be added to. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting experiment, I feel. And with Quentin Tarantino, I can tell you 100%, He's been approached by a lot of NFT companies and providers, and he said no to all of them because he said, what is the point of me um, uploading something that is already public and then everyone can see it and download it? Um, and then why would anyone buy that if they can already get, like, you know, get a copy of it? And the, the idea of like keeping it a secret until the first person buys it that really clicked with him. And we got that feedback from a lot of artists since then that we talked to. So apparently there's, there's a need. So Guy, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people learn about um, Secret Network and find the docs and um, uh, find the grant program and so on? Right. So uh, uh, if you go to secret.network, 
uh, and that's scrt.network. Uh, you should be able to find uh, pretty much everything that, that you know you need. Um, and then you can find uh, there's the uh, uh, ad secret network at Twitter and we have a discord and you can follow me at uh, at guyzis, uh, G-U-Y-Z-Y-S on Twitter. Um, and if you want to apply for a grant, you know, just hit me up on Twitter personally or come to our Discord, come to the dev channel or the general channel, say, hey, we have a grant idea, we want to talk about it, and either myself or one of the team members will talk to you. Perfect. Thank you, Guy. Thank you very much.